So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the third week of debate. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, now, uh, this time around, it's going to be the, the week of debate on how to value water. So, uh, for what it's worth, uh, how to value water, uh, subjective versus subjective perspectives. Um, so, uh, the, we have two speakers now. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Pete Klopp. Uh, he develops a a PGM 20 billion euro investing in solution portfolio, including impact measurement. He also manages uh, a number of special projects, including ESG integration in, in a strategic asset allocation. Before joining PGGM Investments in July 2011, Pete was at the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C., and held senior positions at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the private sector. Uh, as water resources expert, he worked at the World Bank and the United Nations. Uh, Pete holds a master's degree in water, in water resources management from the Wageningen University and applied environmental economics from the University of London. Uh, our second speaker is uh, David Sedlan. He is an assistant professor at Leiden University College at The Hague, uh, where he teaches various classes uh, on economics. He received his PhD in agricultural and resource economics from UC Davies. He blogs on water, economics, and politics at aquanomics.com. He has two books, The End of Abundance, Economic Solutions to Water Scarcity, and Living with Water Scarcity. Uh, he gives many talks to the public, professional and academic audiences, and writes for popular and academic outlets. And well, he also lives in, in Amsterdam. <laughs> and, uh, and, and our moderator is Dylan Mack. He's uh, the, the project manager at uh, Value Water uh, with the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment uh, for the past three years. So uh, we found him like the, the most uh, uh, like applicable moderator for, for this debate. So now we really uh, would like to 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 uh, ask the, the three participants to join the the, the table. And, so uh, um, now we're going to give a few words to to Willem, and then we will begin with the uh, with the presentations. Thank you very much. Um, myself. Well, myself. Um, yeah. Now to go. Yeah. Thank you very much, and um, from, so um, I'm very glad you are here. Um, we are working on uh, value of water already for quite a few time, as you may know. Uh, it's one of the subjects of the high-level panel on water, which is a panel consisting of 11 heads of states, our Prime Minister Mark Rutte being one of them. And somehow uh, it ends up that the Netherlands chose the subject of value in water as the initiative to lead within the panel. And, um, <coughs> well, uh, and I ended up as project manager to lead this. <laughs> Uh, and it's really uh, an intriguing subject, and I'm very happy that we're here now in this scientific environment to hear your comments on this subject and we have two talented speakers on this subject. I don't want to tell much more about it. Let's just listen to the, <coughs> to the speaker and I'll introduce Pete, or Pete has been introduced, but it gives the word to Pete. And then we go into debate, and in the second uh, part of the session, I really would like you to join the debate so we can really interact on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. I think, can you hear me now? Um, if I turn this on. I'll get it here. Yeah, that also works. Because I've got slides here that I want to show you and also to keep myself on the straight and narrow here. Um, my name is Pete Klopp, as you can see from here. And I play the trombone. <laughs> playing, playing, against the tide in many ways. Um, I started off as a water, Wageningen water engineer and then I lost the plot, frankly. Um, I moved from engineering to economics to finance. Um, the engineering got me to places like Yemen. Then I quickly discovered that the technology is almost always there, but you know, what are you going to use it for? And then it becomes a matter of incentives, that's economics. And eventually I started wondering, you know, okay, but if all that is taken care of, Where's the money? Who's going to pay for this? And that got me to PGGM. PGGM is the manager of one of the biggest, the second biggest Dutch pension funds. This is a nation of savers, as you may know. Um, and we, uh, we like to save for our old age. And there's huge pension 
pots of money here in this country. This one has 210 billion euros in it. And I joined PGGM because it proclaimed itself the world's most responsible investor. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's see what, what, what's in it. Well, at first, not a whole lot, frankly. But then over time, the past five years or so, we learned to be for certain things rather than just against certain things. You know, nobody wants to do child labor, but what do you want to invest those 210 billion euros into? Well, we picked four themes, climate, water, food, and health. This was before the sustainable development goals came along. Water is one of them, and I guess that, that was my ticket to this, this meeting here. Now, the problem with pension fund investments is that, of course, we want to be around in even 30, 40, maybe 50 years time, because even then we'll still have to pay out pensions. So we have a long-term investment horizon, which is good for difficult things like water. But we are still accountable on a, on a much shorter term, which is very tricky. So the moment we don't make our financial returns, the shit hits the fan. Pardon my French. <laughs> and you can, in fact, lose a lot of money while you are going to be right eventually. So this is a very tricky balance to strike, you know. You can invest for the long haul, but even but if you're, you're getting killed because you don't make your expected returns, your financial returns in a year's time, then it's game over. So this is my, my new problem and, and my new challenge. Pensions first, impact as a bonus. That's the kind of organization we are. We care about impact, but the first priority will always be paying out those pensions. And you can only do that with real money. <laughs> Now, water is then a priority investment theme, but it's hard to invest in, and that's the topic of, of, uh, of the night, I think. Um, this is a familiar graphic, I think, to many of you. Maybe not. It comes from the Water Resources Group 2030, and it projects the water supply gap, the, the black box in the middle. You know, there's demand on the left side, there's sustainable supplies, or supplies deemed to be sustainable on the right, and they won't match anymore in the next very near future. So there's a supply gap. This is the technical part of my presentation. There's going to be a supply gap. You see that here. I'll talk a little bit about the investment gap and then eventually about the finance gap. It's not a whole lot of slides. There's only 10 or so. Oops, sorry. So there's a... This is another graphic, you know, saying the same thing. There's going to be a supply gap. There's simply not enough sustainable water to meet projected demands. In the OECD countries, we're doing all right. But of course, the challenge will always be in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and in the rest of the world, ROE. So India and China stand out as particularly problematic. That's where water simply won't be there, at least not on a sustainable basis. So what to do? Invest, you would think, you know, let's just fix this. <coughs> and in fact, that's the underlying rationale that I very often run into, you know. In te technical people, engineers, you, always seem to think that you can fix this, this thing, you know. If push comes to shove, you know, we'll find our way out. We'll engineer our way out of this pickle. Well, maybe we can, but you need a shitload of money for that. 260 billion for capital expenditures, capital investments, and even more for operational expenditures. So that's the sort of money we're talking about here. Now, that's, that's drinking water supply and sanitation. So that's where the bulk is going to be needed. And the 9.6 that you see a little bit um, below there, that's the sort of money that would be required for proper water resources management. Either way, this is a lot of money, money that simply won't be there if you just look at investment uh, at, at the uh, multinational um, development banks um, or at, at governments even. There's simply not enough public money to plug the investment gap. The numbers, of course, are a bit, you know, plucked out of thin air. They could be, you know, not an order of magnitude, but a few billion euros left, right or center. You know, you, you could easily um, allow yourself that, that, that 
the range. Uh, this uh, on the right has the numbers slightly different again. You see that water is a sizable chunk of the infrastructure requirements globally, but it's not the biggest chunk. I put it in, even though it doesn't quite correspond with the earlier numbers, I put it in because water is just one of the many things an organization like mine can invest in. We picked water as an interesting theme, but if it proves to be too difficult, we'll do something else. I think this is important for a point that I'd like to emphasize at the very end, but I'll give it away so you can chew it over already. The, the regrettable thing is that a big social need, even a big, hairy, growing social need, does not necessarily make an investment opportunity. So need does not equal investment opportunity. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. The need is obvious, very obvious. Um, the, 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 the investment requirement is also very obvious. What is less obvious is that investors like Peter Jim will actually plug that gap. But let's see how far we can get there. Because water is underinvested in many of the places around the world that we would like to invest in and that we in fact do invest in, you, you encounter a lot of problems, water risks. They're there because water is underinvested. So what are the consequences of that? There's competition around water, there's weak regulation, there's inadequate infrastructure, there's pollution, there's climate change, playing its funny games with water availability. All that has business impacts. This is when it becomes interesting, not just to the water sector itself, but to every other sector that depends on water. That kind of dependence, those risks, they have financial consequences. So water is biting us either way, you know, either on the opportunity side, where there may not be enough opportunities yet, or on the risk side, where other sectors, other investments suffer because of all these water-related risks. So water becomes a financial issue, which is all the more reasons for all the more reason for organizations, again, like PG Gem, to start looking into it seriously. So there is a supply gap, there is an investment gap, and the investment gap, water being underpriced, also leads to an incentive gap, you could say. You know, if water is underpriced, you know, you'll see what happens. No surprises there, you know, if something isn't properly priced, you know, people are going to make inefficient use of it. That's the nature of the beast. So underpricing has two implications. The incentive is not there to use the water efficiently. And the incentive is also not there to invest in it in the first place. Why would you invest in something that is given away for free or nearly free? So there's this fundamental thing that's wrong with water that makes water such a difficult thing for us to invest in. It's underpriced. The, 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 sorry for the quality of these graphics, and you can't read the left one at all, but I'll tell you what, what you can find there. Uh, these, the, the one on the right here uh, has stress against prices, and it's almost inversely related, which is odd. Why would it be that in Denmark, which happens to be the top bar on the left-hand side, why is it that water is most expensive in a place where it's less scarce, or least scarce, perhaps even? And why is it that water is underpriced where it is yeah. most scarce. So the, the top bar is Denmark, the bottom bar is Saudi Arabia. How weird is that? So water is expensive, $7.23 in Copenhagen. But if you go to Riyadh, you're good because it only costs you three cents. The Riyadh water is mined water. At one point, there won't be any. Well, it's maybe desalinized water. It's a mix but it's going to be, it's very expensive water. However, what you pay is almost ridiculously cheap. This is what is wrong with water. Pricing makes no sense. It has almost no relationship to scarcity. Maybe this is pushing in an open door, I don't know, but this is what makes water problematic for an organization that would like to do good, but doesn't want to lose money in the process. So here's my clincher, you know, when is a social need not an investment opportunity? Well, that's when, if the water drops, water availability drops, prices don't go up. You know, that makes water weird. Come on. If it, is, if it stays at $1 a watt, you know, a cubic meter, whatever, 
even though water levels are dropping, even water scarcity increases, you know, that's weird. So existential values of water, you know, all the values, cultural, social, optional, all these, these, these soft values, but real enough in our cultures, they are much bigger than the price we pay at the tap. But it's worse, really. It's not just it's not just those values that are much bigger than the price we pay. It's also the economic value. It's worse still. It's the financial benefit that very often, in many, I think in the majority of cases, is vastly bigger than the price you pay. What does that mean? That means that you would you would like to pay a lot more. You can pay a lot more. You don't have to, so you won't. But you can because you derive so much benefit from that water. But you get it for free. Well, nice, nice, good for you. But again, makes for a tough investment case. And then the worst, my favorite though, is when the supply cost outnumbers the price of water. So if you pay less, then it will cost the supplier to get that water to your tap. That's the, that's the weirdest of all cases, right? But all very real, you know, this happens in, in the majority of places. So you can't even pay the proper price, it costs the utility to get you to the water, to get you the water in your home or in your um, com company or, 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 or production plant. So here's Barcelona, of course they've got bigger problems right now, but they had one in 2008 too. <laughs> They had one in 2008, which is, here's Barcelona, and yeah, they organized the Olympics. This is not a backward town or anything. It's a beautiful place. But they ran out of water in 2008. All the same. Of course, you know, bad luck, a dry summer and all that. But it was more than anything, you know, poor water pricing. Farmers in the watershed that, uh, on which Barcelona depends for its water, they pay less than 1% of what it costs to get that irrigation water to their fields. So the supply cost was 100 times bigger than the price they paid for that water. Now that's, a, that, you know, how can you invest in, in, in something that is so underpriced? Problem. So here was Barcelona, down to actually shipping in water from the south of France. The water actually arrived by tanker. That's how desperate they got at one point. <coughs> and that's an immediate consequence of underpricing. Prices are often discussed in terms of morals. You know, you can't price for something that's God-given. Well, tell that to the people in Barcelona. You know, God-given or not, they ran out of water. And then all of a sudden they did have to pay, because these tankers didn't come for free. Now, here's the, 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 the clincher. There's a supply gap, there's an investment gap, there's an incentive gap, but that's almost the same as the investment gap, you could argue. And then there's a finance gap. How do we find investors that are willing to come up with the money, the huge numbers that we saw earlier? First of all, why don't they yet do this? You know, Why don't we jump on the social need? Well, here's the familiar arguments. Prices don't convey scarcity or pollution or any other water-related problems. They're just not baked in the prices we pay. It's hard to build an investment case if you don't understand the risks fully, you know, that's part of it too. There's all these multiple values, the Blagio principles talk a lot about that. So you have political interference, you have this on-off sense of urgency, you know, then you're getting ready to invest in China because it has a drought and all of a sudden money flows and then by the time you get there they have a flood. You know, that happens. That's water, right? It's on and off again, at least in people's minds. And then there's the engineering confidence, you know, that uh, I meet that a lot in India. I don't know offense to India, but and India is another country of engineers, right? So I go to NTPC, which is a big, a huge utility, and they have a vast dependence on water, and yet they can't be bothered with the problem of running dry. Because, you know, when push comes to shove, they'll fix it. They can fix that. Come on. No pricing needed. Then 
the problem is um, that financial analysis often comes as an afterthought of all too ambitious water designs. This happens a lot too, you know. Um, it has little to do with water supply and sanitation or partly to do with water supply and sanitation, but the Jakarta Bay, for example, is a huge project, right? Protecting Jakarta. So the bill is 60 to 80 billion euros. That's stiff. That's a stiff bill, you know. You won't find an investor that says, yeah, that looks fine to me. Let's do it. So first came the very ambitious design and then the giant bill and then nobody dared to do anything anymore. You know, that can be a problem too in the financing gap. On the other hand, sometimes you have projects that are simple, too small, therefore too expensive, too risky, too difficult, etc. So all of this happens and conspires to make water hard to invest in. Now the Blagio principles, they're, they're wonderful, you know, I've read them and, you know, I barely hold back my tears, you know, it's beautiful. <laughs> but they do little to mobilize private finance. You know, it's, 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 it's all true. There's not a word I disagree with, but they don't bring on board the, 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 the big money you'll need to actually fix that supply gap, fix the infrastructure. So, what to do? Now, this is the last one I, I hope for you. Um, there's a few things we can do to make it more attractive, then, I think. Well, more attractive at least, um, yeah. There's an economic and financial cost-benefit analysis. You'll always need to do. And very often we forget that, right? We do the technical analysis, and then sometimes we do the economic analysis. But you also need the financial analysis, which is simply trying to answer this very, very question, who's going to pay for this? And who would want to pay for it? Who benefits from it? And can we perhaps charge the cost of that particular investment to that particular user that has a financial direct benefit from improved infrastructure or whatever it is. So financial cost benefit analysis should really go hand in hand with economic analysis and technical analysis. Not an afterthought, because then you, you, this is the Jakarta example perhaps, then you have a 60 billion dollar master plan, but no idea who's gonna pay for this. <coughs> Pricing according to supply costs. Forget about existential, existential values. Forget about economic values. Perhaps even forget about all these other values. Simply try to cover the supply cost. That's a massive challenge. Not just in Riyadh, but in many of the other places. You saw in between Riyadh and Copenhagen, including Barcelona. Then there's a few things in um, uh, supply cost. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the water risk monetizer. You forget that. I'll, I'll get to it if you really want to know later. But and then there's a few things. We invest in infrastructure, we invest in private equity, in, in, in listed equities, in almost anything under the sun, because otherwise you can't, you can't deal with that, that huge chunk of 210 billion euros, right? You have to get a little bit of everything. So we invest in infrastructure, and there the main challenge appears to be that in many of the countries where water is that, that acute need, we have very much doubt with about you know government policies and its capability to pay back the debt. We're happy to buy their debt, we're <coughs> happy to lend them money, but only if we're confident that that money will eventually come back. Challenging. On the technology side, many promising technologies are way too small, at least finance-wise. Um, so here we, we almost become a victim of our own size. You know, if you are trying to manage that much money, you can't do it in little bits of a million here and a million there. So in infrastructure, for example, the hurdle is 50 million. So if you only start looking at opportunities once they're 50 million or bigger, a lot of the good stuff won't even get to your desk. Very unfortunate, which is why we need to aggregate those small good ideas into something that makes it worth our while. So sometimes it's too big, but very often it's too small and you need the aggregator or aggregation to make, make an investable opportunity from that. I think a very promising way to do this is blue bonds. Maybe you've heard about this. That's money that is raised by governments, can be provincial or local governments or national governments, can be international development agencies or banks. They raise money from the capital markets, that's people and organizations like mine, and they 
raised that money for a particular purpose. Way back you had war bonds. In the US you had infra bonds. You had all sorts of bonds tied to a particular purpose. I think this is, especially in this day and age, when money is so cheap, interest rates are so low, you could raise a ton of money that way and tie it to specific water projects. I think that's a promising avenue and one that is already being used, for instance, by US municipalities that sit on very creaky, lousy infrastructure that needs to be replaced real soon. They found this way to raise money to do just that. And um, uh, yeah, I see that you're getting a little nervous, but I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, this, this is something that I, I'm happy to share later, but it's way too small. But the key is this. You can talk about values. And value is ultimately an opinion. That's what you get. But not, never ever confuse this with price, which is what you pay. And it's the price that makes the investment case. Well, thanks a lot. That's a very good clip. Uh, I think, David, that, that's something that you uh, pick up. For this your, is just uh, to set up David, <laughs> yes, and he can get mad. <laughs> well, that's why we're here for a debate. I'm trying. <laughs> Shall I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please, please go, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, Pete put up a cartoon from my book. It's hard to disagree with my own book. What is this thing anyway? It's a microphone. You oh, can is throw it? into the public. Oh, oh so that's, the public. Okay, that's your toy. Okay, good. So, um, I, um, yeah, I was told that we're supposed to debate things and I'm supposed to disagree with Pete, but unfortunately, uh, I think we agree on too many things. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is uh, I'm going to give a few comments because uh, my slides are this back of the Bellagio principles. There's the front, there's the back. But I have um, some comments that I wrote down while, while Pete was speaking. We'll keep that up there. That's a good uh, image. Uh, as well as some comments that might be a little bit um, uh, broader scope in terms of this discussion, this debate. So, uh, and also I'm very glad to be here and, and I look forward to your controversial and challenging questions because if we just agree all the night, it'll be kind of boring and you'll be sitting there trying to get to the borough. Anyway, um, so uh, first of all, I, I disagree a little bit with Pete because I think that it's, I agree with him, it's not a technology problem. I don't think it's actually a money problem. I think it's a governance problem, which is really underlying most of the problems that we have with water management. Uh, you're here in the Netherlands, which is practically speaking uh, on the edge of underwater at any given moment. Uh, they're on downstream from the Rhine River, which is a, a kind of full of industrial and agricultural effluent. Uh, and yet I have the best uh, drinking water uh, potentially in the world, in Amsterdam, and as, as well as in these other uh, parts of the Netherlands. Uh, so the technology is there, the finance is clearly there, and I think in the case of the Netherlands, there's at least 800 years of governance of evolution with the water boards and so on that underpins the system. So I pay a lot of attention to governance gaps, governance issues, more than, for example, finance gaps. Um, and when it comes to the, the slide he put up earlier about a supply gap, uh, this is, as an economist, there is no such thing as a supply gap. You've got supply, you've got demand, and whether or not they meet is an interesting question, but if they do not meet, uh, as in there's more demand than supply, you're not talking about a gap, you're just talking about misery. And in most parts of the world where water is not adequately supplied, the misery we have is uh, a lack of food security, the misery we have are children who can't go to school, the misery that we have are ecosystems that are almost always under threat because in developing countries, I think they have the correct priority, which is to take care of their people, but the uh, impact of that often is that the environment is, is left behind and that actually has negative impacts uh, in the future for those same countries uh, that usually they regret later on and almost always negative impacts, impacts on the poorest people in those countries who cannot cope with the lack of uh, what are called ecosystem services but really mean uh, functioning environments. Uh, I, I want to point out that uh, everything we're talking about is going to be made worse by climate change. Uh, the only thing uh, that, that we can count on is that climate change is going to increase the water cycle uh, um, um, velocity, which is going to cause uh, uh, bigger droughts, bigger floods, uh, bigger temperature extremes, and the water cycle is going to be uh, the enemy of far more people than it is today. Uh, I'll advertise one of my books right now, which is Life Plus Two Meters, which is a, uh, an attempt to get people to think differently about how the climate change will change their world. Um, and I'm, I'm doing that book project with, uh, at the moment, the second volume with the aid of 35 other authors, 
because uh, we think in some ways it helps people to have an imagination. It's like a science fiction type of thing. Uh, but I think everybody in this room should be thinking not just about any kind of system that they're familiar with, but that system being broken by uh, unexpected uh, types of, of behavior. As uh, I come from the US and uh, I think that one of the best headlines was Houston hit by third 500 year storm in three years. So uh, that's actually how bad it is uh, in terms of what might be happening and of course how badly Houston was prepared for that which was I think entirely predictable. Uh, it had nothing to do with technology or with a lack of money. It had to do with a governance failure. So. Now, to uh, some of the things I was thinking about before I, I heard Pete's talk, uh, I wanted to bring up some, some different ideas. These are just um, thoughts that you might take into account when thinking about the value of water. Uh, one of them is a very famous uh, paradox, the diamond water paradox, uh, that's associated with Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith, by the way, was confused about this paradox, and what he said is, why is it the diamonds, which are so entirely useless, are so valuable, and water, which is so important, is so cheap? Uh, and this is, he wrote this in 1776, and it was 100 years later that economists figure out the theory of what that was. And uh, the theory of that was that uh, if you have plenty of water, then the additional units of water are very, very cheap. But when you have very little water, you're in the desert, there's one liter of water, and you have a diamond ring, you're definitely willing to trade the diamond ring for the liter of water because the water is scarce. So water scarcity uh, uh, is really what drives and determines water value. And uh, now I'm going to join into what Pete was saying. Uh, I'll, I'll try and disagree gratuitously if I can, but uh, the value of water is, of course, very subjective. Uh, and we should take that as a starting point, not as a problem. It's something that we should keep into consideration. It depends on the person. It depends on the use of water. Uh, if you're drinking the water, I'm sure you put a higher value on it than when you're washing your, your uh, uh, floor or, uh, uh, or when it's raining outside. Um, it depends on time and place, of course. If, uh, if there's a drought, uh, everybody's upset about not having water. If there's a flood, they're upset about having too much water. So the value is changing within an individual in the day uh, or over the course of a year or a location. So values, no one's ever going to agree on what the values are. So we definitely should stop thinking that we can actually find values. But what we can do is we can try and reconcile values. And reconciling values happens in two different ways. There is an economic method of reconciling values, which is using prices and markets. And there's a social or community or political method of reconciling values, which is involving voting or meeting, meetings or poldering. It means that a bunch of people have to agree on the values that they're going to have. And <clears throat> the market value uh, and the social value are not reconcilable. You cannot reconcile the environmental water flow with the cost of a bottle of drinking water. You need to keep those managed separately. And uh, the book that I have, Living with Water Scarcity, which is free to download, by the way, <laughs> is divided into two parts specifically because of this aspect of water. So the, the first part is what I call economic water, and I call that the simple part. The second part is about social or political water. That's the difficult part. And, and in the book, I actually say I'm going to explain part one, part two. but. What I would say in terms of how to understand or manage water and, the and, and by the value of water, I would say first we, all of us as a group, need to decide how we want to manage our social water. We need to set aside a certain amount of that water for uh, the environment, usually that's the most important part, uh, but also uh, shared infrastructure projects, for example. Uh, uh, and, uh, the, the, and once you set that aside, and in a developing country, that set aside will usually be low compared to how much they want to reserve for economic water. But uh, you set that aside through a political mechanism that everybody has to agree to. And I'll get to all the problems with that discussion. But then the remaining water, you can use al uh, economic allocation mechanisms. So for farmers, that would mean a market or a price. Uh, for city people, you would have prices that go up when the water is scarce from drinking water, which uh, Pete pointed out doesn't happen. Uh, so you need to have the, the, the social water separated from the economic water because if you mix those metaphors together, those management methods together, activists get upset, economists get upset, water managers get upset, nothing happens, nothing works. So that's actually what happens quite often in this, in this world. Now, uh, I think Pete said something absolutely true, which is the value of water is not the same as the price of water, which is not the same as the cost of water. And uh, if you're unlucky, the cost is higher than the price, is higher than the value. That does happen. Uh, the, the kind of interesting good news is Saudi Arabia reformed their tariffs 
uh, about just over a year and a half ago, as I had a paper in press discussing Saudi Arabian water, they moved it from the 99% subsidy, which was in this figure, up to a 0% subsidy uh, as a way of, of uh, uh, closing that financing gap that was also leading people to waste water, just as predicted, which was also leading that system to be uh, not maintained because there was no revenue to maintain the system. They constantly needed subsidies. Um, so we need to remember that, that these three concepts should not be mixed together. Uh, but as part of this discussion, we have to remember in, in with, when it comes to water systems that the price, which is you showed the, the price per cubic meter in, the net, in, in Denmark, the price almost always, I would say 99% of the time, directly shows water as free. So the, you're paying the price of the system, that's the price of the pipes, that's the price of the, of the labor, that's the price of uh, uh, building the, the reservoirs and so on. Those, that price, those are system costs. The price of cleaning the wastewater, which the, the, in Denmark they actually take much more seriously than other parts of the world, that's the price of water. And the water itself is free. In Denmark, it's everywhere, so they have no problem. But in other parts of the world, where I come from in California, it is still free. Even if you go into the middle of the desert or Las Vegas, which is definitely in the middle of the desert, you only pay the system price. That is why the price of water in Las Vegas is one-fifth the price of water in Amsterdam. And the water consumption in Las Vegas, I know you will be surprised, is five times the water consumption in Amsterdam. So guess what? Economics still works. If it's cheap, they use a lot of it. If it's expensive, they use less. And, and we can have many, many, many examples of that. So if you price the water too cheap, then people will use it according to their, their own value, but they certainly are not going to use uh, what they should be using in aggregate to keep the system uh, uh, robustly, uh, 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 let's see, robust against uh, problems and preventing shortages. So you're going to have shortages, and Las Vegas is always on the edge of a shortage in a disaster. Uh, I'm, I find it interesting that the Bellagio principles are not named after the, the casino in Las Vegas. They are named after a very nice town in, uh, in Italy that is constantly uh, swamped with tourists and a difficult place to visit because they can't manage their prices, uh, but they're Italian. So that is something that we should talk to them about parking. Uh, now, I don't know if they had the discussion when they were talking about value of water, but uh, now, the thing is, so what I said earlier is that if we want to manage water as a private good using prices, that's absolutely simple, relatively speaking, to uh, managing it socially. So the problem with the social uh, water, the environmental water, or we're running out of water, is that uh, it's hard to aggregate those values. Um, and why is that hard? Because traditionally, you'll have a large group of water users known as the... Trick question, come on. Who uses the most water in every country in the world? Agriculture. Agriculture, thank you. And they have had a traditional right to that water. And some people comes along and says, but we're environmentalists, or we care about the environment, or there's ecosystem services. But sorry, property rights, or political will, or whatever. And so actually getting any kind of agreement on how much water to take out of the environment is almost impossible anywhere you go. I know in the EU, it's pretty, pretty much broken down every time the common agricultural policy comes back into discussion, uh, because there's an idea we should be environmentalists, and then all the farmers say no, and then they, that's the end of the discussion. So it's actually really hard, even in one of the most bureaucratic parts of the world, to actually have this as conversation. But the result of not having that conversation is the water is mismanaged in terms of its values and use, and you get a lot of people who are upset. Now, two minutes? I'm almost there. Well, four or whatever, I'm almost there. Uh, so the, the, pro the political process of reconciling these different values is left, left to politicians. Politicians have a couple problems being in charge of this process. The first problem is they are uh, limited in how much they understand. And what that means is they'll usually uh, decide to do nothing or they'll decide to do something that's very simple, which is, to, for example, to build a huge dam uh, or a desalination plant <coughs> or um, something else large and grandiose that they can cut a ribbon in front of rather than pursuing a thousand small projects, rather than uh, trying to uh, uh, get people to have their own behavior affect the water supply demand balance. The second thing uh, that politicians tend to have a problem with doing is uh, contradicting water managers because almost none of them have any idea about engineering and the water managers are very good at telling them to keep doing what we've been doing, although that doesn't work, but the politicians don't want to fight with the water managers. So they have very little uh, to, to uh, go with in terms of alternative plans. 
they won't listen to economists, of course, because economists don't understand how to turn pipes and all kinds of stuff. So economists uh, are usually uh, not listened to. Uh, lawyers tend to be listened to. And then you have engineers versus lawyers, and that doesn't work at all. <laughs> and then the last problem with politicians, I think you'll probably be not surprised to hear, is corruption. And the biggest kinds of corruption, there's, there's very simple corruption, which is I will uh, put uh, water to the people that give me money. I'll take a bribe. But a much more difficult problem of corruption is what I call uh, the corruption of preferences or the corruption of beliefs. And that's the politician who says, this is what we should do because I think it is best, even though that politician is wrong, but they won't find out that they're wrong because they have no objective way of understanding it. They're going on their so-called gut, right? And the United States is on their second gut president. It's not going well. But uh, if you have people making decisions based on their gut rather than, that, rather than on what is good for the majority of people, then you're going to have mismanagement of water. So um, the good news is, and this is not really good news, that if you get wealthy enough, you tend to care more about the environment and you tend to have better political institutions. And that combination of having more money and more care and better political institutions means that you tend to have better water management. But the road to get there can be brutal in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the people who are suffering, the poorer people. It can be brutal in terms of uh, environmental damages uh, and, and uh, damaged ecosystems. Uh, but we do tend to see a very high correlation between better water management and uh, uh, country wealth or individual wealth. Uh, but the majority of people in the world, and I think uh, people who are at IHE, certainly study this all the time because they have a lot more experience in, in, in developing countries. Uh, those people are struggling with, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough expertise, we don't have political will. And that's where uh, these discussions should be happening, but they're very difficult to have. Finally, um, I want to say that no matter what water management system you have, and I mean in the whole, the whole IWRM, the whole integrated water resources, so environmental water, agricultural water, drinking water, industrial water, no matter what system you have, it has to be flexible. And it has to be something that will cope with a drought, it'll cope with a flood, it'll cope with a change of your industry from potato chips to silicon chips, that's an old cliche, and it'll cope most importantly with climate change. Because the systems that we have right now are going to face those uh, impacts of climate change, and many of them have never been tested against the kinds of uh, uh, circumstances that we're seeing. Um, as we just were reminded in, in Houston, and also much more tragically in, in the Caribbean where um, several hundred people died. It was better than thousands, but several hundred people died because of uh, poor preparation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very love fault, actually. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> Let's just just uh, jump into the debate, um, and I would just first like uh, to ask Pete because Pete uh, was first and he didn't have the chance to react on David, <laughs> and David had a chance to react on Pete. So Pete, from hearing what David was saying, and you agreed quite a lot with you, but there were some things which you were saying. Well, maybe I don't agree. So can you give some of your thoughts? <laughs> Well, I think this is a bit of a straw man, I'm, I'm pulling up here, but that, that's, that's fine. You know. David, I think, in essence says, you know, it's the government, it's the government's stupid. And I simplify my argument to it's the prices is stupid. And of course, this is a chicken and egg thing, right? If the prices were reflecting scarcity or reflecting pollution or reflecting any water-related externality, then government, governance would probably get in line. You know, then things would work like they work in Denmark, for example. But the opposite is also true, of course. If governments were organized well, prices would probably go up. Or, and we would find a way to shelter the you know, people who, can't re who really can't afford it from those higher prices. Like we do in so many other areas, right? So I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg. They go hand in hand. But for the sake of argument, let's, let, let's just, I'm sticking to my guns, you know. Get the prices right. You know, this is the mantra that the World Bank has been saying for for decades now. Just get the prices right, and everything will be fine. Um, well, it works for a financial organization. You know, we certainly do want to contribute to solving the problem, but again, we also want to make our money. 
And then prices are indeed the very heart of our, our, our argument. Um, I do, of course, understand that there is social water, there's environmental water, there's political water, perhaps. And maybe we should have a set aside for all that. I think that all that can be arranged. But that does nothing, that does not do away anything from the importance of prices, which is the only thing that makes us behave <coughs> well, use water efficiently, and it will bring in the money we need to build the infrastructure, or repair the infrastructure, or desalinize seawater, or you know, do, all, do all the other expensive things that we'll need to make sure that everybody gets his or her water. But oh, back to the man. <laughs> well, David, you, you wrote a lot about uh, behavior and economic relations between behavior and prices. So, um, what's your reaction to this, uh, uh, let's say, strongly simplified uh, uh, approach? What's your, your uh, how do you see this? Well, he's right. Uh, Thank you. Okay, we can all go home now. <laughs> he's wrong, though, oh. about the uh, chicken versus the egg. I think, uh, no. The, I, I think. Uh, so the, I was differentiated a little bit between what I call social water and economic water, and if we, I, I, I think we can go back to the idea that you can't price environmental water. I think we can kind of agree on that uh, because everybody shares it. You can't, you can't in economics, you say it's not excludable. You can't separate. It, you can't put a border around it. Um, and so in that sense, uh, you have to have some way of thinking about how to uh, take care of your environment. And there's a shadow price, or there's a value, but there's not really a good market price. When it comes to uh, uh, back to drinking water or uh, water investments uh, and uh, the World Bank and, and infrastructure, uh, I, I think that there's much more governance comes first and the price comes later. Uh, I don't know of a single country where the price is right and the governance is also not right. So I think governance is a uh, necessary condition, good governance, but not necessarily a sufficient condition for having the price right. Uh, the only time you do tend to see that actually is where uh, the uh, government has been taken out of the loop entirely. Uh, India is a good place to find bad water management. Uh, and uh, where they have is a, a quite a common problem with setting the price of water, something like uh, say five cents a cubic meter, which uh, is almost always uh, uh, far lower than the cost of delivery. And so you have <coughs> service areas that are very limited uh, and, and you get much, much more worse kind of behavior. But what you do see in, in some of these parts of uh, India is uh, despite, uh, number one, you'll see private tankers that are delivering water, usually at, at least 10 times the price of the, the so-called uh, tap water service that isn't there. Uh, but, and, and the people that are lining up to buy that water, number one, they, they, uh, uh, that's the best choice they have, but you have these entrepreneurs that are showing up that are essentially providing private water. We also see this with uh, bottled water companies that are selling bottled water of uh, varying quality in various developing countries. Um, and there uh, they have, the governance system is not functioning to uh, provide uh, drinking water services but they do have a price uh, for their product and that product is fairly reliably delivered and it does what it's supposed to do. So uh, that's the absence of governance and the price works. So I think maybe uh, 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 as, as water systems go, uh, you need to have governance, but in terms of private markets, you don't necessarily need to have governance. So maybe that's mixing up the messages, but um, I, 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 I think, yeah, that's all I'll just say, blah, blah, blah. But that means that you could take out the government, because that's what you think is a, if, if you, some things work, yeah. if, you, if the government is out of the loop, then things would start to work. Well, it's worse than useless, is what I'm saying. Yeah, things would start to work, but at the price, you know, I think we've all been to places where, where the poor, in particular, pay state water prices. Mm -hmm. um, it's expensive to be poor, you know, as uh, the saying would have it. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in Kenya for a couple of years and I paid a whole lot less, a lot less for my water coming through the mains if they worked at all, you know. Yeah, yeah. Then the guy who was working for us, who would buy by unit of water, you know, by liter of water or cubic meter of water. So the unit cost for me was a lot less water coming through the mains than it was for him buying water on the, on the street, you know, from a from a local uh, water tank. <coughs> so I think this just illustrates what happens if value 
and cost and price differ. You get all sorts of weird things. I just read the other day that farmers in India, I think it was in Karnataka, were pleading with their power utility to continue power cuts. Why? If the power would be delivered 24 hours a day, then farmers would irrigate their fields 24 hours a day and water levels would go down real fast. So just to protect the groundwater, they would rather not have power. Imagine, you know, if you are in that kind of a situation, how much more sense it would make to price water according to its scarcity. They would probably be quite happily paying slightly more for their water, perhaps building renewable energy, whatever it is, so, they, so that they could have both the complete supply of power and conserve their groundwater. But that, that equation isn't, that, that solution isn't in the works just yet. But it could, if only we would be willing to, you know, price according to scarcity. And just in this specific case, there is actually they're planning a, a program where they uh, install solar uh, uh, power pumps and, and they sell the power to the grid. And the fact that they sell the power to the grid gives income to the farmers and that appears to be more attractive to reduce yeah. the number of water they uh, uh, they use for, for irrigation. So just an example of how things could work. It has only started recently, so we don't know whether it will really work, but it's a kind of a way of putting things upside down. But let's, let's go back to the discussion. So we say um, a government is neat, because if you don't have a government, uh, the, 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 the prices are getting in a very weird situation, like what you expect. So there's some kind of a government's control thing. Yeah, so it's obviously, it's, it's much more complicated, right? So. Uh, uh, the, the Ostrom's owner and Vincent Ostrom are associated with what's called polycentric governance. And polycentric governance means circles, that one circle, a bigger circle, a bigger circle. So governance, um, uh, is, it's, it could be very much top-down governance, the national capital setting the standard, for example. It could be local governance, like a local community kind of water utility. And that's also, and it's a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer governance, a, a kind of managing commons. So, I, I don't. I, I do want to say that governance is very important, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't want to mix up all the governance models. And one of the most uh, uh, famous examples of, of uh, water management failure potentially is the Cochabamba case in Bolivia, uh, the water wars from around 2000 or so. And and that was. And I, I love telling this story because everybody thinks they know the straight story. Here's my version of the straight story. Number one, the local public water utility was totally failing, and the services were terrible, and uh, uh, corrupt, etc. And the World Bank said, we need to have a privatization because they were on their uh, neoliberal bandwagon. And they had a, a single uh, bidder for the contract, so they, made, they replaced the local incompetent public water supplier with an uh, international incompetent private water supplier. <laughs> And they, that private water supply was event, uh, eventually thrown out in what they call the water wars. That was a, pretty much what everybody paid attention to. But then they didn't pay attention to what happened next, which is that it went back to the local incompetent water supplier. And <laughs> literally same business as usual happened. Now, when I was researching this, it was actually sad, but it didn't stop there. Because uh, in a community that's near Cochabamba, a much, much smaller community, uh, they were giving an example of how they had a, a cooperative, essentially. And they had a governance model. The governance model was the neighbors. And they all walked on the water lines. They made sure people paid. They made sure people didn't steal the water. They made sure the water supply was kept stable. And so that local community, which was much smaller, Cochabamba is a very big city, but that local water community, uh, water management was, was robust and, and sustainable. And it was the exact same education, the exact same water catchment, the exact same, even more primitive technology. So in, in that sense, it, you can have very much success uh, and that's because the customers were, were also part of the management team. Um, yeah, that's, and there was yeah. something, oh, also I want to say uh, uh, India. So in Gujarat, they've gone further uh, because they said, we will give you reliable power supply for two hours a day, and that means you don't pump it otherwise, and they keep their groundwater yeah. sort of in yeah. place. So that was a version of this, yeah. <laughs> but they made it into an actual planned program. Thanks. So you, you're explaining about a, a certain model of government that will work, mm -hmm. but there are also quite a lot of governments which is not really working. And the question is, how do we get that working? Because, and there I, I step also back to the private system. How, how can we, and to the value, the, the mix you say value cost, uh, value price cost, which are not aligned to each other. 
So the question is how how can you use the value of water and the discussion about value of water uh, and, and use talk that to governments to get this wrong balance of value, price, cost, and to, to, to turn it into the right balance. So how can we also from that value point of view and also from the price point of view uh, come to uh, improve the governments? Well, you know, I think there's not a hard and fast answer to this one, but I think there's a few things that we could do better next time we seriously try. I mean, in the 90s we tried this, right? This was the World Bank at its uh, most powerful and most intimidating, Cochabamba and other places. I think the mistake we made back then was that prices going up, or attempts to price according to scarcity, came with privatization. And that is almost, you know, it, it's it's... It's adding insult to injury. Um, you can you can then nicely blame the private company, and everybody does, because it's such a great enemy. You know? Even though the idea behind paying more for something that's scarce, it costs a whole lot to get to your tap, is sound. This is when I think slowly the Dutch model or the Danish model came in, where water is being priced according to scarcity or to the cost of supply and treatment etc but it's not done by a private company so you don't have that that extra difficulty of the of, of fearing that some private uk or france company french company is trying to rip you off poor people in Cochabamba. so i think that's one thing sensible prices doesn't equal private <coughs> that's one thing the second thing, of course, is that you need to allow yourself time. You can't go from a low-level equilibrium, low prices, low service, to a high-level equilibrium, high prices, high service. That's ultimately where you want to be, because only at that point, you've got the incentive to be efficient, and you give investors an incentive to invest. But you can't get there overnight. So what do you do? You need a credible path to go from low level to high level equilibrium. I think this is where multinational banks have a role to play. Now, luck would have it that in this day and age, not in every country, mind you, but in quite a few countries that struggle with this problem, the cost of money has never been so low. You can borrow at ridiculously low rates. You know, it's all bad news for us pension funds, it's bad news for us savers, but it's good news for those who come up with water projects, because the cost of financing those projects has never been lower. So you could argue that this is the time to try to go from low to high level equilibrium. Maybe thanks to those blue bonds, maybe the World Bank and all the, all the, all the other international financial organizations need to issue those bonds. We'll buy them, because we're crazy. We buy them because we can't put everything in equities or in infrastructure or in private equity. We buy government debt. It only makes you 1% or 2% or 3% a year, so that's a low return. But if you're on the other side of this equation, life's never been better. So if we can't get to the high level equilibrium now, whenever. Well, that's very enthusiastic uh, form of... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Pete. This would help. Maybe we could just. Yeah, there you go. About that. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's uh, something I uh, I call the uh, the, the public-private <coughs> public cycle, and the cycle. So I, yeah. I'm writing a paper right now about the history of the Dutch drinking water sector, and the history which started in, in our paper uh, in terms of being interesting around 1850. That history started off with. Uh, uh, private uh, vendors trying to make money selling, uh, it's called it, it's one cent per emmer. So one cent per bucket you would buy the water brought from the dunes in The Hague and Amsterdam. And uh, the private guys were there because the, the, the public sources of water were polluted, the canals were disgusting, uh, the groundwater was disgusting, if anybody who had money was buying that. Uh, and then at some point the government got into its mind that it might be good to have a good public water system. It was after thousands that died of cholera over a few times in the 1860s. And then the government started putting a huge amount of money in, and they weren't necessarily getting that money out, so there was a subsidy. 
And once the system got built, uh, then uh, people said, oh, now let's actually, I think, corporatize it. It wasn't privatized, but let's corporatize it. And in the Netherlands, it's, it stayed that way, and there's been this massive consolidation and so on. But the, the pattern still holds is that when, and this is, this is going to sound like a cartoon cliche, but when it's a private company, it's okay for them to invest a bunch of money and charge a bunch of higher prices. This is very easy for politicians because they blame the private company. When it's a public yeah. company, there's massive pressure to reduce prices and to serve, the, they call it serving the public, but in fact they're not. Because if they start reducing revenue, they start going undermining uh, maintenance, uh, and so on. I was in, on a consulting gig actually in Ukraine before they had their uh, revolution, and they were saying, we're going to, to make it just kind of sort of, we're going to screw up our entire water management system. What do you think? And I said, that's a bad idea. And then they didn't hire me again. That was a World Bank project, actually. So uh, the thing is, is that politicians have their hand on the lever, and they really have an incentive to push the price down, uh, obviously below cost in many circumstances. And, and what we're talking about now is how do we have drinking water, how do we have environmental water, how do we have major infrastructure? There's a big political role here, but we don't see these discussions happening with phones. We don't see these discussions, or famously, with mobile phones, right? Uh, you can get mobile phone service that's far more reliable than the, the, the drinking water service in any, any, almost any part of the world, and that's because there's a market versus a political sphere. So you have a political interaction, you have uh, water supply companies, if we're talking about drinking water companies, they're monopolies, and uh, they have to be regulated. So here's where I'm going to totally disagree. I don't think it's private versus public. I think it's the quality of the regulator, which again is governance. And the regulator has to keep the monopolist under control. And one thing that I see not happening is water managers being fired for failure to do their job. This is to me, I, I, I don't, I have no examples. And if you have an example, please tell me of a water manager who is fired when water uh, uh, scarcity is declared, or when you have uh, you don't have 24-7 service, or you're supposed to fill up your bathtub because that'll keep you going for the next week. I don't see water managers getting fired for failing to do their jobs, unlike what you would see in the car business, or the phone business, or the, the printing of books business, or the restaurant down the street. They would be fired, and that's not happening. So there's a lack of discipline of the monopolist. And the regulator is the one that's supposed to do this. And if it's a private company, they should be uh, fined and lose their contract. If it's a public company, they should be uh, 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 also punished. And as my parting example of this, I'll give you that the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the largest utility in the United States, they own three nuclear power plants, a dozen coal plants, they have a lot of power and water capacity. But a couple of years ago, they, uh, uh, whoops, failed to manage one of their, uh, it was a, a sludge pond. So it's a, uh, it was the leftover stuff from burning coal that is not good for you. And they, uh, the wall collapsed after waiting for several years of, of warning reports, and it cost over a billion dollars of damages. And after that uh, happened, um, the managers, of course, were never fired, and they raised the prices of their services to their customers to pay for the damages. So this is not how it's supposed to work, but we see this every day in the water business. Not business. Okay, well, <clears throat> let's, let's, let's come in and help, uh, ask some help the public, because the, the way is, how are we going to do this? Uh, regulators is, uh, is, is mentioned, but even regulators need, who is going to... Who's going to watch the watchers? Exactly, yeah. Who is going to watch the watchers, and how, and then you come again to politicians, where we have that question which we were talking about before, how do you motivate politicians to, to get this on the agenda and to do the job for watching the watchers? Um, well, let's let's ask the public. What 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 are your thoughts or questions related to this? We need to know. Uh, thank you. Now I'm going to do something. Throw the bomb. Yeah, yeah. the box. Yeah. 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 If it works, who, 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 go, go one at a time. Don't throw it the whole way. Yeah, this is, this Teamwork. Is, yeah. Well, I can try. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that that didn't go so well. It made it. Does it work now? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Well, well, now what do you do? You, you talk into it. Okay, let's do like this. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I have a question. I heard the term behavior a couple of times, including delusional engineers and corrupt politicians and uh, regulators. However, when I think uh, about the behavioral turn in policy making, we're living in one of the best established principles of behavioral economics is that human beings simply suck at estimating 
future costs. Right? We constantly and consistently and systematically underestimate what it costs to maintain things, to repair things. So when I hear corrupt politician, uh, the corruption of belief, isn't that that these politicians are just human because you know 99.5 percent of all human beings simply do not see the cost of scarcity, the future cost of scarcity. So, are you asking for politicians that are not human, essentially? <laughs> and also the same thing for the investors. I heard the investors who would love to do the right thing as long as the prices are right. But if I picked up Kahneman thinking fast and slow from airport bookshop, I already know that the highest returns of investment are probably to speculate on politicians getting it wrong and invest in the companies that will be paid to fix the things after they break. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I got part one, I think. So, uh, thank you for talking about behavioral economics. Uh, I think that uh, I'm going to use an example of uh, thinking ahead and the political class doing their job and the situation representing a good plan for thinking ahead. And that's the Dutch pension system, which is, as I understand, one of the best run pension systems in the world. And I don't mean current management, although that's great, but I mean in terms of being fully funded. And when I, I was here for a couple of years and I went back to the US and I said, I want to take my pension with me and ADP said, you can't have it, we're underfunded. So we'll give it to you when we have enough money. And that to me was actually a very adult response. Now, let me contrast that to the United <laughs> States system where the pensions are woefully underfunded to the point to the tune of, I think, $50 trillion off the books, by the way. This is not part of the budget deficit. And it's mostly underfunded because the pension managers are allowed to assume they're going to make 7, 8, 6, 8 percent, I think you probably know the numbers correctly, per year, even though the markets are not re returning anything close to that. So you have a political class in the Netherlands and a political class in the United States. Now, you might think that the Dutch political class is far more smart than the American political class. Let's not have that conversation. But <laughs> what, what I think is going on is that the, the Dutch population, the Dutch voters, the, and, and the Dutch society says, really, we need to have a system which we can un believe and trust and work with, and you guys should provide it. And it's a very simple, I think, one-page memo that says, have the money there when I retire. And in the United States, they haven't gotten that memo. So it's not a question of intelligence. I think it's a question of political will. So I don't think, I, I, I agree with the behavioralists perspective that we're not really good at forecasting the future, but I think there's many examples of professional managers or professional politicians who absolutely can diagnose a problem and absolutely can uh, induce the correct behavior. And that's not being made because of a choice, not because of a myopia. Second thing, which is part of the same problem, is that should we actually get together and think, God, I wish politicians would do this job, then you have a collective action problem, which is to get everybody involved in forcing those politicians to do something. And in many parts of the world, uh, collective action is difficult. Sometimes because politicians don't allow political opposition, they shoot journalists, they put everybody in prison. We have many countries in the headlines for doing that. Uh, sometimes the country is uh, mismanaged out of control and, and no one knows what's going on and they don't like their neighbors. And sometimes, sometimes the country has a, a, a good collective action mechanism, which again, I will cite the Dutch as having, uh, I don't think the Dutch are unique, but the Dutch have a very good uh, history of working together through the poll and so on. So collective action is important to enforce uh, good behavior on politicians. And, uh, and you know, this talk is not supposed to be about politicians, but the value of water in some ways is, is um, it, if, it's, if, if politicians are not going to pay attention to it, then in many cases we're left with these so just private solutions, which are, they'll work, but they're far less efficient, uh, as we've seen with climate change, than uh, it would be if we actually had a good uh, uh, social political dialogue. I like the question too. You know, I think uh, there's a lot of truth in, 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 in uh, perhaps picturing politicians and investors as just a bunch of rodents. You know, we've got the investment horizon of you know, the average rat, and there's something to that. Um, and maybe we're looking for superhumans to guide us to the sort of investments and decisions that we need to make long term. But the fact is that we're short term animals. 
Um, no offense to any of you here. Let me just talk about myself. I'm a short-term animal. You know, I right now, on a gloomy day like today, I, can even, I can't even imagine that one day you'll see the sun again. That's how short-term I am. But, just talking on the part of PGM, you know, um, we try to be that long-term investor. And yet, you know, mayhem occurs if we don't have that coverage ratio that David was mentioning. You know, if we can't pay out those pensions, tomorrow will be the paper and, you know, all hell breaks loose. How do we try to be that long-term investor anyway? You know, pursuing investment opportunities is not the only thing we do. Prices aren't reflecting scarcity and they may not necessarily do that in the foreseeable future. But we've got other games we can play. If prices don't convey the notion of scarcity and don't lead us to those opportunities, there's also the risk side in which we're working. So, if indeed companies, as I, I stuck in one slide that tried to make that point, you know, if indeed other companies in our portfolio suffer because of water scarcity, you can also try to make that risk they're running into more, um, more real to them. And that also has investment implications. Rather than pursuing opportunities, you can also try to get rid of the laggards. And we do. And we do. So if prices don't convey the message, maybe be better risk analysis will do the trick. Now, this is not another something that we need to get much better at, and hopefully one day with, with some of you. Investors try to trust statistics much more than they, try to, than they even try, let alone are capable of trusting scenarios. I think it's the scenarios that we need. It's not just the risk today, it's the bigger risk tomorrow that we need to understand. Now, investors then are quite capable of doing away with companies, projects, countries perhaps even, that aren't up to the job. In that way, they indirectly send the message, get that governance in order, or we can't invest in your place anymore. So that's another thing we do. Um, that's still about money, it's just playing defense rather than <laughs> offense that we spent the first part of this, this evening talking about. So we aren't quite at the end of our tether waiting for prices to reflect scarcity. We can do things in the meantime. And in a way it's all upping the ante, you know, like those farmers in Karnataka. You know, please don't give us power because it will cost us our water. <laughs> and that's the sort of bargain, the sort of message that we try to take to, you know, those water dependent investments that are also part of our portfolio. This is the one thing that you need to keep in mind. If you manage that big money, You've got a little bit of everything. So these big universal, we call the universal owner of all these different companies and projects, because you've got a little bit of everything. That also means that issues like water affect you always, one way or the other. You can't run away for it, from it. You can't wait for prices to rise. You're already dealing with it right now. So hopefully that makes us less waiting for superhuman politicians and superhuman decisions. Right now we're already trying to punish the ones that don't get it. Can I, can I say a quick yeah, thing? Yeah. So while you're on risk, which I think is a fabulous topic, and, and there's a economists talk about risk versus uncertainty. It's a different story because uh, there's a lot of models that economists use to try and understand uh, the climate, for example, and they're totally miscalibrated. So that's a different, uh, that means that economists don't know how much risk we're facing, by the way. But when it comes to uh, risk, I think that uh, there's a, what I talk, people always ask me, I want to get into the water market, I want to buy water. And I say, well, you need to take into account what I call regulatory risk or political risk. And that could change the value of your property, uh, whether you're an insurance company, whether you're a water owner, it could change it overnight by a factor of 10. And uh, in that sense, the water sector is extremely difficult to invest in because it's so unreliable. Uh, to invest in, and that's because of this kind of uh, regulatory risk. So that that's, I think, what investors look at. They say, too many problems, basically. Oh, oh yeah, this, throw the box. Oh, the the, box. Can, the, we, can we try to, right, now can we, we can we try to throw the box down? Yeah, this is working. Uh, thank you so much for the insights. And, um, is it working? Is it working? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. You can so, talk to the box. Um, we have been approaching water management from an investment side. 
because that is what you do and that is your job from an economic side is is a market approach and, uh, uh, and looking for profit the way to solve the water issues that we have now is that the approach that we need to take do we need to because that is the vibe that I get a little bit from the discussions now is the market will solve everything when you price it right or do we need to look at other values mm -hmm. yep. for water? <laughs> Well, part two of my book. Yeah. <laughs> Read it. Exactly. It's, it's only it's a hundred page book. It's not very long. No, but it's the, the what you so we so water is uh, it's called a wicked problem. I guess on the name of the poster today, water is entirely complicated because I might talk about water and you might be thinking this, or I might be talking about water and you might be thinking a rainbow or there's this wave on the wall. So water shows up in so many different ways in our uh, human uses, for example, including in enjoying the environment, uh, including water and poverty and water and agriculture. <coughs> so in some ways, uh, we should be talking about water and prices and, and uh, so, it's a, that sometimes you wanna be talking about prices and sometimes you can't, right? What I said earlier about environmental water, you cannot price it, you cannot say you own it, you don't own it, it's, it's all of ours that we own. And you can't put a price on it. There is no market for it. There's no business opportunity. And that's why I say you have to have a community or a political or a social discussion about that. So um, what, what Pete was saying is in some cases, when the political failures happen, then there will be a private response, but only because people are desperate for any kind of solution. Uh, when it comes to climate change and adaptation to climate change, uh, or even the Netherlands with the, 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 the Delta programs, if, if the, the, the government didn't collect taxes from everybody, involuntarily, no one's being asked if they like that idea, they're just being, the, the money is being taken, and they're using it for infrastructure and flood defenses, then that saves many, many people a tremendous amount of money in terms of building their own escape boats and own walls around their gardens and all kinds of stuff. So there's a value to having a political agreement that we're all going to share this cost, and that is the value of the avoided costs to everybody as an individual. That's because there's a political mechanism, et cetera, et cetera. In many, many parts of the world, have you been to a, a city where everybody has a water tank on their roof? That's the private solution to a public failure. And that is an example of where prices or whatever it is, isn't working. And there's someone who will bring a huge 250 liter tank or more to your house and put it up there and that guy, you're paying that guy money and there's a price and there's a mechanism and maybe you're collecting the water from the rain or maybe when the pump turns, out, one, turns on once a week. So, the, the price mechanism is a very, very um, last minute mechanism for managing water, but it shows up as a mechanism of filling a gap in many circumstances of mismanagement of water. And I, I don't know, but like, I never think about the price I pay for water in the Netherlands, but I, I think it's absolutely a crazy good value for money. But, the, but I know that the system is run on a, on a financially sustainable way. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's it's invisible, but if you go to many, many parts of the world, it's not invisible because there's this mismanagement going on, and and prices won't fix that mismanagement. Uh, it can help in some ways, but there's many, many other things going. Like Saudi Arabia changing their price from 99% subsidy to a, to a 0% subsidy. I think it did help in many ways, but there's other things going on in Saudi Arabia that might actually be worth looking at also. You, so you just fix one problem, you move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I just may add one thing to it, because, you know, of course, investors don't wake up in the morning and say, okay, let's screw over a few more people and see how much money we can make off them and their big social needs. Um, it's just, you know, if, if you would look at water as a coastal defense or, or national defense for that matter, you know, you, would, you could make the case that, hey, let's forget about pricing, let's just give everybody free water and let's tax all companies, all, all, uh, all the population accordingly. There's areas where we do that, and there's no profit in that in that model. Can I? But 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 if you really need the capital that that you know I, I projected right there, um, is there ever going to be enough money in that kind of model to build it, to sustain it, to make us not abuse it? You know, I wonder. Also. Investors do not necessarily, well, at least we do not necessarily need to invest in water. We want to invest in water, but, you know, if it becomes too difficult, we simply would move on to the next thing. So, 
just to mm -hmm. maybe um, comfort you in a funny way. You know that. It, no, we're not there to to make profits no matter what of water. We can make profits no matter what of roads, telecom, you know anything else. So if water gets too difficult, we'll we'll be out. But we think we've got something to contribute. And indeed, it's profit-based. That's true. Okay. You, you, if oh, you want to add more one thing on this. <laughs> so uh, before I, I was, uh, I forgot to add something that um, uh, the, the biggest uh, problem with building a water system, let's say that you don't have a good water system. Uh, and, and in Europe, uh, the water systems were built in the last, since 1850, let's say, going forward. A lot of developing countries are building it for the first time or trying to expand it or trying to keep up with urban expansion. And those, those costs are absolutely massive. You need to have a 50, 100 year payback period because no customer can pay that money back. And if you think, I'm gonna get that, who's gonna pay that money? A pension fund might be willing to pay uh, you know, to, uh, for a water expansion in, in Lagos in Nigeria. But the political risk of never getting that money back is very, very significant. And in those countries, they uh, don't necessarily have functioning fiscal systems to collect enough money to run pretty much anything. So a water system, a road system, electricity grid, all those kinds of infrastructure that are not exactly private, but do have a, a very long payback period, you need to have a, a functioning uh, financial system. And, and that is, um, it's not gonna come from abroad if there's too much risk. It's not gonna come domestically if uh, again, politicians are more concerned about uh, either stealing money or not collecting money, or, by the way, not taxing rich people who are their friends, which is a big problem, uh, also in the United States, for sure. So uh, why, the, why the U.S. has a massive, you know, trillion, five trillion or so infrastructure uh, deficit. Uh, so if you can't tax your own citizens to pay these, uh, at least those upfront costs or long-term costs, then things will break down. And then you have these really half-assed private solutions coming in. That are that usually again protect the rich people because they can afford them, uh, or they uh, um, or they and they leave everybody else uh, aside. So it's like it's a very big problem of injustice and and uh, and prices would if, if prices were there, so many other things would be fixed on the way to get there that the world would be a better place. So the prices are, are not the solution, but they're kind of a sign that things might work. Oh, you. <laughs> Okay, yes. It was strange to talk to a box, but uh, <laughs> let me try. Uh, frankly, it's been a very uncomfortable debate for me. Uh, first, because it was not truly really a disagreement uh, or something, but uh, also because so many things haven't been mentioned and we've kind of had the tendency of looking abroad on how to fix things there. Uh, for me, uh, pension funds have a big role to play. But that is getting out of certain, well, let's say, uh, sectors like fossil fuels, agrochemicals, which are polluting the water resources, all these kinds of issues. If you try to make a difference there, then we can start making bigger differences in water domain rather than investing in public utility here and there, I think. Uh, second, also this idea of, uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw it uh, a while back, there was this uh, video by the World Economic uh, Forum about how great the Netherlands is in agriculture, how sustainable we are and all of that. Well, if you want to talk about tri prices, the reason why our, uh, so, uh, our pigs are so cheap here is because we pollute the whole of the Pantanal and the Chaco region in South America so they, we can have cheap soy, so we can uh, feed that to our pigs. And pollute our own groundwater in the process. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, it, it, that whole mentality of this country is doing better than that one because they have better governance or better prices or better, it's communicating vessels. So uh, it, it, I, I feel very uh, uncomfortable in having that kind of eye in the sky, look this country compared to the other. Uh, I think ways to move forward are, if you're talking about governance, pension funds do really play a big role. Get out of fossil fuel and stop making climate change worse for all of us. That would be a very good step number one. Uh, the, 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 the six or four big agrochemical companies which now are, are ruling the world could also have kind of a bit less of their investment, I, I would uh, agree. Uh, there is also, frankly, I think, too much money. Uh, all these big uh, dam push that is in South, South America, in uh, lost parts of Africa, that is because there is too much money and too much collusion of these sectors with 
uh, el uh, elites which uh, are run also by engineering companies. So I, I think if you want to talk about uh, values, uh, yeah, start listening to the people on the ground who, who actually feel the consequences and, and less about uh, kind of abstract talk here on the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I get a bit uncomfortable. Okay. There's no question that, you know, externalities need to be priced in, whether it's pigs and what they eat and the Pantanal that goes to help. Pantanal that goes to help because of our intensive um, animal farming or what is it, pig farming. I think that's all, that's all true. And pension funds certainly don't do enough. I don't think anybody does ever enough to fix this. But we do make our baby steps. Um, we try to reduce by half the carbon footprint in our portfolio. So we do have to get out of coal, uh, get out of other fossil fuel companies. And we're doing it. By 2020, we'll only have 50% of the carbon footprint in our portfolio. So all that happens. Is it enough? No, it's not never enough. Are, are all those negative externalities priced in, all these costs that we now um, put on the people in, 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 in the Paraguay rather than here, or you know the cost of our groundwater being polluted? No, that's all not in those prices just yet. Um, and even though we're trying, and for some, we do it for reputational reasons, we do it for risk reasons, we certainly don't do it for financial return reasons, because these companies, these oil and gas companies, make a pretty good money for us. But they so, have to be subsidized. So you talk about sure, subsidies sure, and water, sure. not so subsidies economic, and Yeah, sure. You know, but that's the difference between economics and finance, right? It may make economic sense to do away with the sector, just like that. But financially, they're doing well. So, you know, we're in that pickle, right? And, and, and I think we do whatever we can within the constraints that we face. And um, that holds for, ag for agriculture, for mining, for fossil fuels. You know, we try to reduce our footprint there. We try to reduce the negatives. But we cannot force anyone to price in the externalities. That's a government job, you know. And there's no running away from that. Um, is there too much money? Yes, there is a lot of money. And in fact, in maybe that is part of the problem. Right now, there's a ton of money pursuing very dubious projects. So yes, we try to be critical there too. But in a way, we're part of it. You know, we've got those big pension savings. You've got to invest them in something, something that's, that makes money, right? That may make you uncomfortable, but that's the situation we're in. We can't just say, say goodbye to your pension savings, we're out there saving the world. <laughs> How would you like that? <laughs> if there is no world, then what do I need? I need yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there's an as asymmetry. PGM, PGM got 2.5 million people depending on us for their pensions, but PGM all by itself can't fix those problems, right? So there's an asymmetry there. We can't just say to the 2.5 million, hey, yeah, we couldn't fix the world's trouble, but uh, hey, we gave it our best shot and we did it with your money. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm going to say some things that sound awfully familiar, but uh, <laughs> the negative externality. So, um, it, it does, so that what we have, so I, I teach, I'm teaching a class right now about the commons, right? And so you're speaking about the commons in terms of pollution, correct? Climate change pollution is a commons also, or do we all have an agreement about the commons? What the commons is, is uh, the air, the water, the land we share, right? It's not that private area, but you're speaking about uh, the, uh, the, the, there's this idea of a negative externality, so someone's growing soy on their private land, but the negative externality might be the pollution from the growing of the, of the soy is going to the rivers and killing the fish of the people down rivers. Is, is, is that a version of what you're talking about? Or the people building, living in the village next door having to play... Uh, the pesticides on their heads, yes, so those are, it's a negative externality. And, that's a, and what that is, is if somebody is growing the soy or growing the pork or growing whatever it is, uh, the iPhones, there's all kinds of crazy uh, uh, versions of this story, and they're doing it for their own private benefit, and the costs fall on other people. And you just said, I don't like that. I agree with you, that's a bad idea. Or do you still... No, I'm not saying I don't like that. I'm saying I don't like that, and that's where you have a lot of responsibility where you can change. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Yeah, I'm just starting one thing at a time. So, 
the thing is, is that you're speaking about uh, how do we keep people from investing in these polluting industries, oil and gas, for example, and uh, the simple, uh, the whole idea of divestment, which is that they sell their entire portfolio of, of uh, uh, fossil fuel companies, is uh, it doesn't fix the problem if a villain, who will be the villain right now, comes along and buys all that those shares from Shell, uh, World Death Shell, on discount, right? So you have an entire industry that needs to be somehow held to some kind of standard of regulation or behavior, whatever you want to call it, and that requires, guess what, the government to get involved. Now, uh, long ago there was a book written called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, and I don't know if you've read this book, but I read it and I was surprised that it was not exactly what I expected, because what she talked about is the overuse of agricultural chemicals by the United States government. Not the use at all of agricultural chemicals, right? The use of agricultural chemicals under some conditions is a good idea. The overuse is a bad idea. And she was talking about the overuse. The same thing with DDT, which is a very good way of, of trying to limit mosquitoes and stop malaria, etc. So here's an economist who say there's kind of this middle ground between nothing and everything. And so when it comes to uh, agricultural chemicals, the question is, what's the correct amount to use? If people are putting the chemicals on the ground and in the air and in the water, and they're not paying those costs, then that's too much being used. That's probably one of the definitions of this. And if you want that to be stopped or, or, or reduced, then uh, you might have a regulator that will tell that uh, company to not do that, or you might have uh, an entire industry that's held to a higher standard. If all of the pension funds in the world were held to the standard of not investing in polluting industries, then one would, they wouldn't mind that because if they were selling, at least it wouldn't be another pension fund buying and they wouldn't lose there. I will tell you right off the bat that they would sell and individuals would buy, so we're not still fixing the problem. And so the, the issue really that you're getting at is how do we protect the commons when in fact nobody owns it? And that's the commons of the atmosphere, which is climate change, it's the commons of the rivers and the, and the, the local uh, uh, areas, and every time we've ever seen action to protect the commons, it has been through a government action, right? The Montreal Protocol to take CFCs or community action. The Montreal Protocol, the same as far as I'm concerned right now. Okay, the Montreal Protocol to get CFCs out of uh, the atmosphere and save the ozone, oil, uh, whole, uh, uh, ozone layer was a government action, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, the, the, the market is dumb, and there's profit-seeking people in it that are going to take advantage of situations. And if, if uh, Archer Daniels Midland stops growing soybean and trading soybeans, then maybe it's a Brazilian firm that no one's heard of. Maybe it's a Chinese firm that no one's heard of, and they're going to destroy the environment. So in fact, we're not fixing it by attacking the, brand, the, the name brand companies. So I think that we have to get back to this, this, uh, this goal of, of managing the commons. Now, I was talking earlier about the Alliance for Water Stewardship, which I consider to be uh, a talky-talky place, but not, not, not doing anything useful, because what they should be doing is pushing on governments, not companies who they sign up as members, they should be pushing on governments to keep not just the companies in line, not just the international companies in line, but also the domestic companies in line, which are usually the, the relatives of politicians, and also the local small farmers in line, etc., so that the entire water ecosystem is protected. That's what water stewardship is about. It's not about singling out one group and leaving out the other ones. It's everybody has to be uh, part of that same solution. So in that sense, I think that uh, your, your uh, concerns are entirely valid and they must be addressed in a way that brings everybody into the discussion. And I'll give one last example, which is about pigs, ironically, or not ironically, and that is the United States which, has, which was at the start of the environmental movement, had the Clean Water Act, I think 1970, 1972, and ever since the Clean Water Act and every other amendment from the Clean Water Act, pig farmers have been exempt from every uh, necessary regulation. And a, an economist figured out the cost of all of those exemptions would, if, if the farmers clean the water just the same as wastewater treatment systems, just the same as the small farmers, but the industrial scale pig farmers, if they clean their pig excrement and all that stuff, uh, out of the water, it would cost uh, an extra five cents per kilo of meat. And that to me is an acceptable price. But the politicians are hearing it'll cost more, people will starve. The United States, a lot of obese people. So it's not actually a real issue, it's turned into this joke. And the joke is unfortunately on the poorest people who live next to those pig farms that are getting 
really terribly uh, uh, polluted and getting cancer and so on. So, and that's that's the issue. Okay, well, let's, let's just go. You, you mentioned the word stewardship, so bringing it back to water. And I actually would like to bring it back to water again, not, not for, because I think that that feeling of uncomfort that you have, I will try to, I hope that we can bring it back to the water scene, because there we have a lot of uncomfort actually also. Um, Paul, you would like Yeah, I have one more. The box. What box? Good. Oh, oh well, that's how you do it. <laughs> Sorry, kicking it around. Um, yeah, I have a question, like, for this debate, you both looked at the larger principles on value water, and, for example, David, you talked already about water stewardship, and in your presentation you mentioned IWRM. Um, I'm wondering what the both of you think, what is new about the larger principles on value water, and how can these principles uh, help us in the further debate? You're on topic, amazing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure I can even answer this because I don't know. I've read them, but I've forgotten. I, uh, build trust. Build trust. Yeah, who can be against it? Education. I found Bill to disagree with, and I frankly found Bill that it really new. Um, and you know, when I was invited to this debate, you know, I thought, okay, let me let me take this investor rather extreme position that you know get the prices right and stop stop making everything so difficult, you know. <laughs> but um, of course, you know, then uh, David is hired to make the opposite point that, yeah, we need to get the governance in order before anything will work. Um, as to the larger principles, you know, frankly, they don't really help us. What does help us is better understanding of risk, better scenarios, so that in the absence of prices and perhaps even in the absence of proper water governance, we can still make investment decisions that work to the, for the common good. Those are mostly the decisions of the type, stop doing the wrong thing. Whether that adds up to <laughs> enough of a solution is, is of course, you know, an open, open question at this point. But that's all, well, that's not all, but that's an important part of what we can bring to the table. Everything else in the Bellagio principles, I believe, is mostly a public responsibility, a government responsibility. We can't replace governments, nor would you want us to replace governments for that matter. Yeah, I, I thought that, I, I was invited to this and I was uh, busy and I would love to go, but, um, but of course I wouldn't be overwhelmed with the results. So uh, what I wrote down when I first read this is who will do this, who will enforce these values uh, against the managerial man mindset and monopolies, right? So, uh, but you mentioned, I mean, we brought back on the topic IWR, and I think uh, that, you know, uh, if there's a governance issue or whatever it is, the example I, I gave from Bolivia, and many, many examples from, 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 from sustainable, and I, I always love finding them, but they're, you know, they're not in the news ever, sustainable water management of any scale, whether it's the environment, whether it's fisheries, whether it's floodwaters, whether it's drinking water, that's never in the news because it's always working, right? So that's kind of... The, 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 so we're always noticing what isn't working. So what I would do in terms of, of uh, water and water management is push it down to the, using the subsidiarity principle to the lowest possible level and uh, in, in, uh, and, and have them response to things. There's, there's interesting ways of combining groups of people. But the, the, the issue that we tend to have is a professional managerial class that is very, very distant from the people they're supposed to be managing water for. And one example that I put on my blog a couple of years ago was that the regulators should actually be elected from the community, just regular folks, not professional regulators, just regular folks who would say, hey, my kids use this water, uh, we have to pay for this water, and if you can convince me that your investments in the system are a good idea, then I as your regulator will approve those prices. But what, what instead happens often is the regulators are at the Bellagio, the Vegas one, right? Having some more sashimi with the other guys who are from, uh, you know, the, whether it's the Vegas uh, public utility or it's Cal American Water, the private utility, they're in the hand of the water company. Regulatory capture is what it's called. And they go back and they do things and, and the, the citizens have no idea what's going on. And they, so they're divorced from the whole discussion and then they have no power in the discussion. And then when they want to know what's going on, it's a closed door meeting, there's no minutes. It's like local water management, as local as possible, is the most likely management that's gonna help the local people. 
And if it happens at a national scale, the thing that I was bitching about in Ukraine, where they wanted to take it back from villages of 5,000 people back to Kiev, which made no sense, but they wanted to have more corruption, I think. And if you, if you keep it at that local level, you're going to get sustainable water systems more often than not, right? If you centralize it, they're too far away, they're too distant from the issue, and they may not know, and they have no stake in it. They don't, they don't drink the water themselves. And, and I, that's why I also say that like, water managers around the world should drink the same tap water as their customers, because usually they don't. And that, I think, would start things off. No price mechanism, by the way, just an incentive mechanism. They might start paying more attention. If I may answer this, because this, this, this idea of local water boards, you know, in a way, this kind of feels built on the back of that notion, right? That we had water boards before we even had a government, or a central government at least. I think that that is an interesting take on this, because um, I was, before I joined PGM, I was at the World Resources Institute, and um, I led the Markets and Enterprise Program, and I was always accused of what, what you said, you know, hey, you guys only care about profit, and, and <laughs> to hell with everything else. Um, that's not what you said, but <laughs> that was what I was told. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and of course, there's something scary about private enterprise and private investors running a public good. You know, there is something that doesn't feel quite right there. So you need a strong regulator. Mm -hmm. And maybe the regulator has to be in that particular um, format, that indeed you have a water board representing different interests in a particular watershed. But that would then include companies. Companies wouldn't rule it, but companies would contribute it. And companies and their investors would, in fact, up the ante. In that, what becomes a more serious issues, issue the moment investment decisions are on the line? If people don't want to invest, or companies don't want to invest, and investors don't go to places because water scarcity is a serious problem and there's no government capable of taking it on, that's a loss to all. So, our argument in that markets and enterprise program was always, we're not in favor of privatizing anything. We just want to make these issues more urgent, more immediate, more relevant perhaps to our, our governments, by making sure we're at the table, perhaps in the form of those local water boards. I think that's a great idea. And perhaps then collectively, you could, you could agree in small steps perhaps to go from the low level equilibrium to a high level equilibrium. And Companies, I believe, and investors have a role to play there. I want to say one more thing about this. No, it's like the, the, we talked earlier about risk and, and companies, I'm, I'm getting on the company mindset right now. Companies, in fact, don't care about price of water. What they care about is reliable water supplies. And if uh, they can get reliable water supplies, they are absolutely, or reliable, uh, almost anything, they're absolutely willing to pay it because water is just an input for almost every company. And besides, uh, in agriculture where it's a very large volume input, but still a very, very tiny percentage of their cost input, they will trade many, many uh, concessions for uh, that, uh, um, uh, for, for reliability. And, uh, and, and running out of water is extremely expensive, right? So that's a, ma a major problem uh, for companies. They will, they will uh, you know, have to shut down factories and so on. So the, the, the last, group to ever complain, I think, about uh, a regulation that costs more money uh, or a infrastructure upgrade that costs more money. The last people to complain about that will be companies because they can price it into their existing costs. Farmers, exactly the same. Dutch farmers, you could, you could drink the water of the canals with enough regulation and Dutch farmers would be fine with that because everybody would be subject to the same system. So it's, it's, uh, it's there. And companies, and I've had this argument with Nestle multiple times about their bottled water operations. I have said you must push for a deposit on small water bottles or any plastic water bottles because it's a disastrous public relations aspect. And they keep saying, this is so terrible. They're like, oh, we're trying to engage with everybody. It's like, they're just so full of shit. I said this straight, straight to the CSR guy, straight to his face, because they absolutely can't stand the idea of, paying, of, of a cost of a penny more. But actually, when you do it, no big deal, right? So when the Dutch banned the, the free plastic bags, the country didn't collapse, right? Plastic bag consumption dropped by 80 or 90%. Congratulations, it wasn't that hard. So I don't think that, the, I think any company that says it's gonna cost us too much is just lying, but they have to be able, the companies have to be able to go to governments and demand that, and, and they will not do it individually because they won't take that risk. But if the Alliance for Water Stewardship intent does it, 
or the World Economic Forum hint, hint, does it, then it would actually push that, that dialogue forward. Don't ask companies though to stick out their neck, because they won't. Well, thank you very much, because uh, <clears throat> we, we try to, uh, this, this, this debate can continue quite a while, actually. <laughs> Um, but we'll try to make an end to it because we want to have something other, maybe something else and water, which is quite nice actually. Um, but coming to, to what has been in discussion, we have a, um, uh, come to um, <coughs> discussion about how do we get uh, water high on the agenda, how do we get things moving. And then we say, okay, we should have prices right. And we should have governance right. That's governance right. That's one of the big, uh, two things which, and then we find out that they were closely related together. Um, <clears throat> but still, the thing come up, and, and I think we discussed a lot of uh, practical solutions to find that out. How do we motivate this process? And that's something I would like to to to, to come as a kind of a conclusion. That's just actually. I'm very interested to hear your comments about the lateral principles and we take them into account when we're working on this. Um, but the basic thing is how do we motivate this process of getting both the governance in place as well as the prices in place. And price is not as, as something to, to read it, but we mentioned also that price is something the private sector comes at the end because the government is not right in the right place. So maybe we can just summarize it very concisely, I mean, and mm, jump to another uh, part of this meeting, and that is uh, a drink somewhere. But <laughs> So I would like to thank you very much for staying here, for giving input, and there's time after this to come up with additional questions and discussion. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, we would like to... Oh, water! Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much uh, for coming. So the moral is going to be in the front of the tent, which is like a just close to YG, just uh, from the steps to the left. And uh, I have some tickets. And so, so you can bring like two beers in the case of the house. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so and, and then we'll have some, some snacks. And well, hope to see you there for, for a nice after date. Thank you. Thank you.